So now we want to take what we've learned about the central limit theorem for the sampling distribution of sample proportions, and we want to apply it to one of the most important contexts of all, polling. Now, polling is a very big deal in America since the 1950s or so, uh, when Gallup first became a, a household name. But now it's run by companies. Companies will poll their employees, poll their customers. That's why all the restaurants always want you to fill out a survey when you're done, that kind of thing. So polling is a very, very big deal. And we kind of want to imagine how this is going to work. So we are going to, um, in 2012, a Gallup poll was asked 1,021 random adult Americans whether public smoking should be banned in the U.S. And 57% replied yes. So we're going to first start off by verifying that the conditions of the central limit theorem for sample proportions are met. Well, condition number one is met because it's given. It says random right there in the problem. So it is given in the problem. No problem at all. Now, condition number two, for the first time ever, it didn't say anywhere in here that it was independent. So we need to go back and look at condition two. So I'm going to go back to the central limit theorem for a second. So you can see condition one was that it was random, which is fine. Condition two is that it's independent. Now, we didn't worry about this with the coin tossing example because coins are always independent. But we are going to worry about it now because we're polling and one imagines we're polling without placement. So we need to make it so that the population is at least 20 times larger than the sample size. In other words, we need n times p, or excuse me, n sample size to be less than 0.05 capital N population size. So looking at our sample right here, we know that for us, n is equal to 1,021. That's your sample size right here, right? So they gave that to us. And so we want to ask ourselves, is that 1,021 less than, or excuse me, less than 0.05 capital N? Now, we don't actually know what capital N is. I mean, although we could Google it, you know, how many adult Americans are there in the U.S. in 2012. But the population of the U.S. is somewhere around 350 million -ish. And so we can kind of wave our hands at this a little bit and just say, well, of course, of course, 1,021, oops, 1,000, is far less than 5% of how many Americans there are. How many adult Americans, I should say. Right? So we're kind of waving our hands at this a little bit like a magician, right? We're, we're kind of putting in 0.05, what 0.05 is less than, excuse me, what 0.05 of capital N would be. So we're saying 1,021 is far less than 5% of, and we're substituting in here how many adult Americans there are because that's what capital N is. Capital N is how many adult Americans there are, so I'm writing it out in words to show that I understand. So we're just going to say, of course, and we're going to wave our hands at it like a magician. So we're using a logic argument here. Rather than, no, than actually going out and finding what the population size would be, we just explain um, what it would, we just explain it and then notice in words and notice that n is less than 5% of that, right? So we never actually figure out what n is, although we could go try to Google it and find some sources for what it could be, but instead we're just going to kind of wave our hands at it like a magician and say, all right, well, 1,021 is less than 5% of all adult Americans. I mean, geez, that's probably around 200 million adult Americans. We're way less than that. All right, now what about condition number three? For condition number three, we need n times p times 1 minus p to be greater than or equal to 10. Right? That's condition number three. 
Well, n times p times 1 minus p is 1,021. Now, p, p was given in the problem as 57% right here. So that's p. So let me make a note of that. So note, p equals 0 0.57. Let's put that in there really quick. So that means that we can use that here in our formula. So we can say 0 0.57 parentheses 1 minus 0 0.57 and we can find what that value is with our calculators. So let's think 1021 times 0 0.57 times 1, oh nope, clear. I cleared the whole thing, sorry my fault. Clear. Let's try it again. 1021 times 0 0.57 times 1 minus 0 0.57, there we go, is 250.247, which is in fact greater than or equal to 10, so we are happy. There we go. All right, so we have a yes, a yes, and an of course, right? So I'll put in of course yes. <laughs> right, there we go. So we have three yeses. So we have condition number one met, of course, because it was given. We have condition number two, of course, basically because of logic. There's no way 1,021, which is not that big of a number, is not less than 5% of all of the adult Americans in, in the U.S., and that means condition number three, it's a weird thing because condition number two kind of wants little sample size, sample size to be smaller than 5% to ensure normality. But condition number three wants it to be large enough, excuse me, smaller than 5% to ensure independence, sorry. And condition number three wants it to be large enough um, and to be large enough to ensure normality. So it's kind of this push-pull between condition number two and three. Condition two wants n to be small so you keep independence. Condition number three says, yeah, be small, but be large enough that you can ensure normal because you want that normal graph. And we do. We have it. So those are the three conditions. All right, so now... Let's look past that to describing the sampling distribution. All right, so the sampling distribution, when they ask it to describe, what they want is shape, center, and spread. So we will give it shape, center, and spread. Now the shape is going to be normal because all three conditions are met. So that's pretty well, um, that's rather easily explained. I'm just going to say normal. We said it was normal right above, right? So actually, we didn't say it. We should have written it there. Condition three is met. Yes, so distribution normal. As opposed to everything under control, situation normal, which is what Han Solo says in the first Star Wars movie. All right, so distribution is normal right there. So that's why we have a normal shape for our shape down here. All right, then we need the center. The center is going to be the mean of this distribution. So the mean of the p-hats, right? Which according to our central limit theorem is equal to p, which according to our problem is equal to 0.57, right here. 57% right there, that's our, p -hat, our assumed p-value right here. The population proportion p is 0.57. So down here, that will be my center of my distribution. The spread will be equal to sigma sub p hat, which is the big ugly formula. That's the one that is, oops, sigma, which is the big square root p, p, there we go, 1 minus p over n, which for us is 0.57 times 1 minus 0.57 
divided by 1021 down here. So I'm going to make a calculator do that. I have no intention of doing that myself. So I'm going to take a square root and you got to be really careful when you type this or you can use the alpha F1 key and choose number 1 which is numerator over denominator. And you can say I want P which is 0.57 parentheses 1 minus 0.57 close parentheses divided by n which is 1021. So if you have the new um, TID4, actually any TID4, you should be able to do this if you, as long as you have the newest operating system. If you have an 83 or an old operating system, you'd have to do square root 0.57 parentheses 1 minus 0.57 close parentheses divided by 1021. It should look like that. If you have a very old 83, you'll probably need an extra set of parentheses. But again, I would not recommend working with an 83 because of exactly features like that. So 0 0.05 or 01549. And there we have it. So there's the spread. All right, so we've met our conditions. We've verified. Um, that condition 2 is a little weird, where we haven't seen that before, but it's going to come back just as a little warning to you. So be prepared for it when it comes, because you'll have to do that same kind of verification later on, say for projects and stuff like that. And then we've got our shape center spread action right here. That just comes right out of the central limit theorem. All right, so now we're on the last part, which is suppose you conduct your own poll of 1,021 random Americans, and you find that 59.7% of them support banning all public smoking. And that would be unusual. Oh, so that would be an unusual result with a probability of 0 0.038. So what are some reasons why that could be happening? Well, as in with 8.1, there's three big reasons, and these are the three reasons we need to consider when we head into chapters 9 and 10. The first one is that you could have a biased sample, which is actually becoming more and more of a problem now that people don't answer their phones and unless they um, feel like talking or perhaps are senior citizens. This is a really big problem. People are screening phone calls. Um, right, this is actually a big problem with polling in the 21st century is non-responsive bias, right? People are not answering. And of course, there's other possibilities. Um, perhaps you um, let, asked a leading question. Maybe you phrased the question incorrectly, etc. All those other things from section 1.5. It occurred to me I had this kind of backwards, so let me put up some examples first. So it could be non-response bias with people not answering their phones. It could be only senior citizens are answering the phone, or only people of one political party are answering the phone. Um, one type of political party answering the phone. That's all non-response issues. Um, people could be lying. Um, you could ask the questions poorly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's so many different ways. Um, actually, I'm going to make this just party. Um, eh, here, I'm just going to delete that one. That way I can fit it all into three lines. There you go. But you can see that there's just tons and tons and tons of problems. There's lots of ways you can bias your sample. But the problem is that if you do have a bias sample, um, if this occurred, you have big, big problems. Um, problems that, quite frankly, are so large they're insurmountable, or nearly insurmountable, especially with what we know about statistics. There are some ways around it with upper, upper level statistics, but it's tricky. So I'm just going to say what I said before in section 8.1, which is if we do have this kind of bias, we are in big, big trouble. Um, we've, got, we've got big problems um, that are very, very difficult to surmount. And that's actually one of the things that a lot of pollsters and, and statisticians worry about nowadays, that polling data is becoming less and less accurate as non-response bias and other issues creep up. Now, there is another possibility. It could just be a fluke, right? Random things do happen, right? So let me just put, say, stuff happens. 
chance, right? And by random chance. That's what fluke is here. I'm just write fluke. So rare random stuff does actually happen. The probability of this in this instance, probability of um, a fluke in this case is given to you as 0 0.038 right there. So that's the probability of a fluke. And you have to decide, is that so low that I don't think it's a fluke, I think something else is going on, right? So 0 0.038 is low, but it is possible that it could happen. Now if these, so the way the chapter 9, 10, 8, 9, 10 work is that we assume that this first thing is out. Because if this is out, I mean, if you have bias, then you have problems that we can't surmount. I mean, that's just huge issues all over the place. So we assume that number one is out. We always assume we have a fair sample. Whether or not that's a fair assumption is another problem, but that's what we're going to assume. So that leaves you these, these two options. You're going to have a fluke, and you're going to have the other one. right? The other one being uh, the parameters that you assumed. In this case, you only assumed one, but you, it was a big one that you assumed. right? The parameter that was assumed was wrong. All right, let me just put parameter was wrong. Okay, so we assumed, in our case, assumed that P was equal to uh, 0.57 right here. Oh, I made that pink as well. I better change that so that these are not the same color. So let me change this 0.038 to a different color. Green. Yeah, that'll work. All right, so we assumed up above that P was equal to 0.57 right here. P is equal to 0.57. All right, well, if that's the case, then we had this really rare result of 0 0.038. So perhaps what we assumed that P is about was wrong. Maybe it's no longer that value, or maybe it never was. Right, so there's the, the three big ones. So it could be the bias sample, it could be a fluke, or it could be that the parameter we assumed, which was p equals 0.57, is wrong. And then everything that we calculated from that is also wrong.